has um, much concern about um, good water um, and our water supply. And he's in a lawsuit trying to help us clean up our waters in the state. So I'm going to pass this along to Jim so he can start with his presentation. Well, thanks for coming. A um, <clears throat> couple of notes. I have a new knee that I got put in in October, so I'm going to be sitting a lot. I'll probably be bouncing up and down, which will drive Steve crazy back there, but that's okay. And then I also got a very minor cold back in um, October, and it settled into my lungs, and I have a really good hacky cough every once in a while, so if I start coughing up a furball, it's normal. <laughs> so we're going to talk about um, public lands in the United States. And I'm going to kind of go over the history of them, um, the use, some of the philosophy that actually drove getting public land, and also that, um, then talk about some of um, the issues that they may be facing in the near future. And so, um, so our first kind, our first, the land in the United States obviously wasn't always run by Europeans, um, Native Americans were here well before we got here. And their land, um, ideas of land usage and land ownership were different than ours. We, they did have some concepts of ownership, um, but they were quite different. And as much as they wanted to, the Europeans couldn't necessarily um, not learn from the Indians. Um, in fact, one of the really interesting things that we never talked about in American history was before we had the, the Constitution, we had something called the Articles of Confederation. And there was also something called the Iroquois Confederation, which was in what basically what we call New England, New York area. And it's really interesting because the Articles of Confederation and the sort of general rules for the Iroquois Confederation are almost identical. And so a lot of stuff kind of drifted into European thought from Indians that we don't want to admit to. So basically, <coughs> Indians, the different tribes had their different lands or territories. And in this area, we, um, towards later, but we had two competing um, tribes in this area. We had the, 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 um, the Lakota, and we had the, the Chippewa, the Ojibwe, Ashinaabe, the Kansas of Town. And, and so they sort of had areas where the, the tribe would own this land, and other areas where a different tribe would. Um, if you strayed into the wrong land, it could cause problems, um, issues. And then within the, the tribal lands, um, depending on the tribe, and it really depended on which nation, you know, and whatever, their customs were different. Um, some of them could be owned by a family, um, and some of them could be owned by a clan. And I know the uh, Winnebago's over by Lake Winnebago, they had their, their tribal land. And a family could claim land for farming, because they did a lot of farming. Something we don't remember anymore, we all think they were hunter-gatherers, but they weren't. Um, you could shoot your bow and arrow, and as far as the arrow would fly where it landed, that was the land you got the farm. And so they, they had different things like that. Also, a lot of the land that the Native Americans, um, they were mostly matriarchal societies. So instead of passing from father to son, it was from mother to daughter. So that was quite a bit different. The other thing is that, especially the hunter-gatherer tribes, um, they felt that the animals and often the, the other living things on the land also had a right to that land. So it greatly restricted what they would do and how they would take care of the land. <clears throat> so the Europeans show up. Um, they got into the East Coast because there was a huge plague. And um, we all know about the pilgrims and the first um, how, or Halloween, <laughs> um, Thanksgiving. And, um, Squanto, right? Was he the one that was supposed to be? Uh, whatever, in Squanto. Anyway, basically, he hung out with the pilgrims because the rest of his tribe died of a plague while he was over in Europe, and he came back. And um, so, but anyway, they got onto the land, and some of the people coming over wanted to recreate European society with European ownership ideas, but a lot of people. Daniel Boone types. The full color, there was three waves of pioneers. The first wave of pioneers. Basically, they wanted to go live in the woods, more or less, like the Indians did. And they set up, they built a cabin, they hunted, they fished, they grew a few, actually pumpkins was, was an interesting thing there. 
the reasons we celebrate pumpkins at um, Halloween is because that was one of the first crops the pioneers grew. And it was very easy to grow pumpkins in the woods, and so they survived off of pumpkins and deer and bear. Um, so when they got back in the woods, they were like, you know, why would I want to go back to civilization and like work 24 hours a day and, and all this stuff when I can be relatively free here in the woods and you know go hunting once every three or four days and live a subsistence lifestyle is much better than back in the colonies. So they did that and it drove the Europeans back in the colonies crazy. There's all kinds of journal entries raging about all these lazy woodsmen that go off into the woods and don't are productive. Okay. Um, so they moved to live. The other thing that I kind of talked about that, but the myth of the empty wilderness. You know, we, we, we have this myth that we went off into this empty wilderness and built this huge civilization. Well, no, it wasn't empty. There was millions of Indians there. And if there weren't any Indians in an area, it wasn't because they never lived there. It's because they probably all got smallpox and died. Or you were in an area like where we lived. This was a really, really game-rich area, and it was so rich, and so many different tribes wanted it. Nobody was strong enough to control it, so it became kind of an open area. And so they would come in, hunt, and get out. So they didn't run into a party from a, a hostile tribe and end up having a fight. Um, one of the legends that I've been told is that this whole area was prairie. It wasn't very wooded at the time. And Elk Mound, the, where the big tower, you know, like the park and stuff, that was actually used as a lookout post, so the different tribes would climb up the top of that, look around, see if anybody else was hunting in this area, and then if they weren't, then it was safe to go shoot some buffalo and then for it out, or whatever else they were left. <clears throat> so, the, so basically, first wave pioneers, and also, we had the fur trade going on, and the French especially tended not to go into the the, the, the Indian lands and try to change them. They just went to trade and left them in the bank. They tended to leave them alone. The British and the Americans were much different. So this area, this area was settled by the French, or uh, the French were here, and so they tended to leave the tribes alone and just wanted to trade. <clears throat> so then we had the second and third wave pioneers, and these are the guys that always made Hollywood. Okay, so the Conestoga kind of wagon, you know, they're heading off on the Oregon Trail, um, and, but, and then of course you had all of the civilization coming into the eastern part of the United States too, where they went over the Appalachian Mountains, they came down the Ohio River or whatever, and there the idea was we want the land, we want to get rid of the Indians, we want to get rid of the animals, we want to get rid of the trees because farms are good, okay, and, and wilderness is bad. That was the idea. So like when, when the big logging era came to Wisconsin, people were applauding the fact that all this virgin timber was being cut down. People were buying the land and then farming the forest land afterwards. So the whole concept of land use of it belongs to the tribe, it belongs to the trees, and it belongs to the animals. No, it belongs to the person at all. The other thing is the Homestead Act was enacted when Lincoln was president, so it was right around the Civil War time, and the government wanted to get people west. And to facilitate that, they said, and they changed, sometimes it was 160 acres, depending on where they were, but they basically said, here's land, you go build a house on it, you turn it into a farm, if it's prairie, you dig up the prairie, if it's forest, you cut down the forest, and after so much time, if you've made necessary improvements, you get the land. So the great independent, going off into the wilderness pioneer, who um, was glorified in Laura Engel's Wilder books, um, was actually totally dependent on a government handout called the Homestead Act. So in, uh, well from the time of the Industrial Revolution, was 1820s, 1830s when that got going, all the way up until well, the 1870s, we'll see when conservation ideas started. The idea was get a hold of the land and get the resources out of it. And so we cut down the forest, and like I said, we didn't want to rebuild the forest because we wanted farms. So you cut down the forest, you didn't plant new trees, you just... And it was huge, huge waste with like the forest um, stuff that happened. And like I think it was like almost half of the lumber never actually got to the mills. They would get lost in the drives or burnt up or whatever. 
Um, of course, when you're deforesting things, when you're getting rid of the prairies, you're destroying habitat. So a lot of animals went extinct. Um, but we also had market hunting. Um, so animals like the buffalo and around here was the elk. Um, really big thing in Wisconsin was birds, prairie birds, like prairie chickens and stuff. Um, they were just slaughtered in mass waterfowl and put on trains and shipped to places like Chicago to feed people. Um, because of all of the wildlife, the changes of habitat, um, rivers were being dammed, um, drip, you know, most wetlands were being drained. Um, we had massive flooding, especially along the Mississippi River. And you know, if everything flows in the Mississippi. Um, there was no flood control back then, and one of the worst floods was in Tupelo, Mississippi, where it just, like half the state of Mississippi, basically, the whole Delta region of Mississippi, one year got flooded. As you can imagine, a lot of people didn't make it. And then you also had three major wildfires I'll talk about a little more. One was in Wisconsin, the Pestico Fire, um, the Hinkley Fire in Minnesota, and there was a huge fire out west called the Big Blow Up. It was in Wyoming. It was actually in, I got Wyoming up there, but it was actually in three different states. And it burned an area about the size of Connecticut. So as I, as I said, um, wild was bad. It was the idea. Farms were good. Um, you know, although consciously they were trying to build a major nation. You know, the people running the country, the presidents and whatever. We want the United States to be the biggest, most powerful country in the world. We got all this land. First we grabbed the land, and then we decided to build the nation. So there was a conscious decision on their part. And the idea of the <coughs> destiny, I'm sure you all remember that back from high school civics, you know, um, coast to coast and around the world. There's also something called the gospel of wealth. And um, basically, boiled down, it's really simple. If you're rich, God loves you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's more, more to it than that, but basically this developed in the late 1800s. Um, the robber barons loved it. Um, it's actually had a revival now in the last 30 or 40 years, believe it or not. Um, and a lot of these um, evan televangelists are preaching this quite good. The more money you have, the more you're blessed, and the more likely you are to go to heaven, I guess, when you take the gold with you. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so that's come around. And then the other really important thing that starts happening is in the late 1800s, um, I don't remember exactly the date where it happened, but the population in the United States starts shifting from the rural farming communities to the cities. And I think it's somewhere between 1900 and 1910 when we now have more city dwellers than we have farm, farm dwellers, rural dwellers. And that causes a lot of changes in the way people think. One, um, it actually gave birth to the rise of sports. And because people were like, oh my gosh, if we don't have people on the farms working and they're living in the cities, they're just going to like be fat and wimpy and not be able to like be in the military because they're going to be too wimpy to be soldiers. So we have to have ways to keep people in shape. And so you had a lot of people organizing sports as part of how the YMCA and YMCA and all that stuff got started. Um, you had the birth of baseball and volleyball and football all around the same time frame. And that was a lot of this was how do we keep people in shape. Other people said, well, let's get them out in the woods and, and make them go outside and do things. But then you have to have woods to be able to do that. So conservation started, well the first conservation writer was Thoreau, and he was right at the beginning of the um, Industrial Revolution. But his ideas really didn't catch on, and then people started in the 17, you know, late 1800s, 1870s and stuff, people started realizing that the passenger pigeon was vanishing. You know, there was, there was flocks of passenger pigeons that were so big, they would take two or three days to pass in one spot. I mean, there was just literally millions and millions of these birds. Um, the buffalo started, well, first they were intentionally trying to kill off the buffalo, especially out west because, um, you know, those crazy Indians, they went and wiped out the 7th Cavalry, and they were dependent on the buffalo, so if you get rid of the buffalo, then you get rid of the Indians. Um, but also elk and other animals, they were, you know, getting rid of those, but people were saying, well, maybe we should keep a few of them around. 
And so there were some voices that were starting that were saying, you know, we should we should do something about this. Maybe we need some of these out. Maybe we need buffalo. Maybe we need some wild spaces. So one of the biggest um, conservationists and the most important one actually was Teddy Roosevelt. And the reason he was the most important was because he became president. And um, he did some things that really irritated the powers that be, the robber barons of the 1800s. You know, he was the, the first progressive, the Bomos. And as I said, we bought the son of a bitch, and he didn't stay bought. He actually did stuff for the common people. Um, so anyway, so this is a quote from him. We got a couple of them. Um, but basically, he says, above all, we should realize the effort towards this end, and the end he's talking about is conservation. And there's two components to that, but I'll tell you that in a minute. It's entirely our power as a nation to preserve large tracts of wilderness, which are valueless for agricultural purposes and unfit for settlement, as playgrounds, and this is important, for rich and poor alike. So to me, there's, there's really three key words in that first sentence or so, is democratic movement and benefiting both rich and poor. In other words, the public lands are there for anybody to use. Um, where am I? And to preserve it, preserve the game so that it shall continue to exist for the benefit of all lovers of nature and to give reasonable opportunities for the exercise of the skill of the hunter, whether he is or is not a man of means. But this end can only be achieved by wise laws and by a resolute enforcement of the laws. So basically he's saying democracy is stronger when you have public lands and anyone can go into the woods you know, if you look at the European model where the king owned all the lands and you couldn't get on the land unless you were part of the aristocracy. And the sheriff of Nottingham was after Robin Hood because he was actually killing the king's deer. That's what made him mad. It wasn't that he was killing the rich and poor and all that stuff. It was because he was shooting the king's deer and eating them. Um, so another quote from Teddy Roosevelt, Surely our people do not understand even yet the rich heritage that is theirs. There can be nothing more beautiful than the Yosemite, the growth of giant sequoias, the redwoods, the canyon of the Colorado, the canyon of the Yellowstone, the, tree, the three Tetons. Our people should see to it that they are preserved for their children and their children's children forever with their majestic beauty all in mark. Now the interesting thing about that last sentence is that comes directly from the idea of the Native Americans, who, who a lot of tribes had what they called the seventh generation. When you make decisions about land, you think about <coughs> the seventh generation. How is it going to affect them? And so you see where this creep is coming in from the natives and all this other stuff. And now we're starting to look in the late 1800s when there's all this environmental devastation going on, very deliberate in the devastation. People are saying, wait a minute, we need to rethink this. Okay, anybody here heard of Gifford Pinchot? Okay, we got one. Okay. This this guy was actually very amazing. He was he was Teddy Roosevelt's boxing partner. Um, he started the world's first forestry program at Yale University. And he also was the first head of the U.S. Forest Service. And so he was very influential and, um, in getting national forests set up and, and really <coughs> the tone for a lot of this stuff. And um, so and that's a picture of Lake Manoa, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's just right um, back there. Yeah, so anyway, unless we practice conservation, those who come after us will pay the price of misery, degradation, and failure for the progress and prosperity of our day. And I picked this picture because, you know, the red cedar at one point in time was as clear as any trout stream. And it's been turning green ever since they cut down all the white pine and turned it into farmland. And the record's pretty clear about that, actually. So their prosperity, they didn't do a good job, and this was the result. John Muir, he was another amazing conservation leader. He founded Sierra Club. He also had the ear of Teddy Roosevelt. 
In fact, they went camping together several times. I don't think they went boxing. I don't think you boxed them like, like you did Jeffrey. But anyway, um, everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play and pray in, where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul. So they realized that not only was there a practical part of um, setting aside the woods, but there's also a spiritual element to it. And, and it's good for, for more than just, you know, and part of what, I, I didn't talk about, I'll get into it more, but Pinchon, part of what he said is we need to replant the forest because eventually we're going to need more wood. We're going to need more trees and we need to plant them so we can harvest them later. And finally, Sigurd Olson, who started, when did he start writing, in the 1930s? And so there's sort of a progression with these people going on and, and he was um, instrumental in getting the Boundary Waters classified as a wilderness preserve in that area and wrote a whole series of books. Um, and those wounds were actually, that's a picture we took up in the Boundary Waters. So I was amazing. It was amazing actually. Um, I, they were out on this lake and I hopped in my canoe and it sat down in the bottom and let the boat drift. And normally wounds, especially with a, a baby, are extremely protective. And so I figured they were going to get attacked or they were going to just disappear because they've been attacked by loons before. Just, be, just by being on the same lake as they had a, a check. But they let me drift in really close and get some nice pictures. So. But anyway, um, um, Sigurd said, um, wilderness to the people of America is a spiritual necessity. An antidote to the high pressures of modern life, a means of regaining serenity and equilibrium. I think he wrote those in the 50s. So, you know, once again, we're saying we need to be able to get away. Relax and, and do these things. So the fires, the big fires, the Hinkley fire, the big blow up of 1910, and the Pestigo fire. A lot of people died. Um, we actually don't know how many. On the Pestigo fire, they have no idea because there just wasn't any remains. Um, people just they burnt up the end of the point where they could even find them. Um, there's a lot of people living out in the woods and they just don't know. Um, same thing with the Hinkley fire. Uh, they had a better idea on the big blow up, but still it was a lot of people. Uh, so that obviously made the news. The huge fire people weren't, the news wasn't much different back in the day than it is now. If they got something sensational, they're gonna run with it. They just didn't have TV, it was all newspapers. So everybody knew about it. Um, and the Forest Service had been set up before 1910 but there was people that didn't like the fact that there was public land and public forests and they were in the Senate. And so they had pretty much, and it's going to sound real familiar, made sure there wasn't enough funding for the Forest Service. So when these fires hit, they were unprepared. They sent Forest Service people out. They even called out with the big, the big burn. They actually sent even military folks out there to try and help. But they had no idea what they were doing. They didn't have the equipment. Um, so these fires just got totally out of control. And like the Pestigo and the Hinkley fires, those were areas where there was lots of logging going on. Um, and the fires didn't have a central source when they started, but they would cut the fires down. There was lots of slash and all sorts of things left over, and they would just burn it so they could clear it so people could farm it. And so you basically had what we now call a fire storm. And uh, what, what really interesting about the Pestigo fire was, um, not, a good, not in a good way, but the American military studied how the Pestigo fire started during World War II, and then they used the same techniques for their fire bombings of cities in Japan and Europe in order to burn the cities to the ground. And um, what, what they figured is there was lots of little epicenters where the fire started, and then they came together and they actually, was, the, the fire was so powerful, like a hurricane, it created its own weather. And it sucked wind in, it put rain in, I mean, it was pretty amazing what happened. So anyway, um, after this fire, um, fire was bad, because people died and things got burned up. So the mission of the fire forest service became suppressing fire. And so they totally ignored centuries of fire as a um, ecological force in nature and just said, we're going to put out every fire. And they had what they called the 10 o'clock 10 o'clock in the morning rule, where if they found a fire, they wanted it out by 10 o'clock the next morning. It wasn't always possible. That was kind of their concept. We will just put fires out. And we're actually still having problems with that today. 
because um, in areas where no fire has burned, you have what's called fuel loading. In other words, you got all this wood there, half of it's dead. It's all ready to burn. And when a fire does start, the fires get much more intense, much hotter. And so they figured it out probably 20 years ago that sometimes fire is a good thing, but there's just so many problem areas that they haven't been able to deal with them all. Okay, so I'm going to run through now um, a bunch of different types of land, uh, public land, both in Wisconsin and nationally, and what they what they are and what they do. So first, we have the national park system, and this is this is actually their mission statement. So the National Park Service preserves unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of the national park system for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations. The Park Service cooperates with partners to extend the benefits of natural and cultural resource conservation and outdoor recreation throughout this country and the world. So the world's very first national park was Yellowstone. And we're the first nation to have a national park. No one had ever done this before. And it was created by Ulysses S. Grant, the president, 1878. And it's been copied by nations all over the world. Um, and it also created kind of the whole idea of tourism. You know, there was tourism before, but the idea of going to a place to be in nature and to observe nature really got started by creating Yellowstone National Park. And when you think about how big tourism is right now and how many people go to the national parks, which is 275 million people visit our national parks every year. That's a lot of people. And that generates an awful lot of economic activity, an awful lot of income. You know, I was Geez, when, when, when did we go to Yellowstone? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, so we were there for a week, which was actually quite unusual. Um, a lot of people were there overnight. In fact, we, one of our um, pastimes when we were there, we were camped in Grant, it was Grant Village Campground, was watching the cars come in in the afternoon. Especially the ones from California were the ones we got the biggest kick out of. Um, like this, you know, they would they would get there and they would get out and they would look at the trees and look around and breathe the fresh air and look around some more and then they would open the trunk of their car and they would take out a box and it was labeled tent and it either came from Walmart or Kmart and then they would open the box and then they would get their tent out and they would look at all the pieces and, <laughs> and a half hour later then they would have their tent up and then they would get out their boxes with their sleeping bags and. You know, I, I thought it was actually great because people were going from the city to the woods. And yes, they had absolutely no clues what they were doing, but they were there. And that's really important. And usually they were there for a day, maybe two, and then they, we would talk to them and they were heading to another national park. And they would do like that was their vacation, you know, a, a day or two in four or five national park. Um, and we, the National Park Service. As you can see from the list, the rest of the list of all the different sorts of designations we have for public lands run by the National Park Service. So we have parks, we have national monuments, um, and those can be big or small. It can be anything from the Statue of Liberty to uh, like some of the national monuments that Obama just declared right before he left. Those cover some pretty significant areas. Um, you have National Lakeshore, so which we have one here. We got the Apostle Islands, National Lakeshore. We have National Seashores. We have trails and we have national riverways. And here in Wisconsin, we have the St. Croix Riverway. And it covers the Namakagan River and the St. Croix River from their headwaters all the way down to where they confluence with the Mississippi River. So it's a lot of land, it's a lot of different things, and there's a ton of opportunities for people to get outside and do recreation. And uh, that cartoon, whatever, didn't print very well. But anyway, there's a whole bunch of animals there. <coughs> And last year was the 100th um, anniversary of the birth of the National Park Service. And it says, um, I'm sorry, um, but that's all, we, that's all Congress would budget for our celebration. <coughs> yeah. 
And, and actually, yeah, the National Park Service is greatly underfunded, as, as most of these things are right now. <coughs> National Forest Service. Um, this is the one that Gifford Pinchon ran. Um, that picture is, by the way, is from the Schwamigan National Forest. That's Marengo Falls, which is real close to St. Peter's Dome. And yes, that is me lounging there. Um, <laughs> But um, they, so we have, um, we used to have two national forests and they were now merged into one unit, the Schwamigan Nicolay. Um, the Schwamigan has most of its land up between Bayfield and Hayward. And there's also a big chunk down near Medford. And then the um, Nicolay portion of it is over north of Green Bay. And there's a big chunk of land there. Um, there's national forests all over. Another close one a lot of people here have probably been to is the Black Hills. Um, that's a very popular spot, but there's lots of national forest land all over. And then we also have some national grasslands that have been set up to try and preserve prairie and stuff. So national forests, they are managed for multiple uses. And this is where it gets really interesting because if you look at that list, um, extraction of timber and minerals, oil, whatever, restoration of bad habitat, Recreation, um, including but not limited to hunting, non-motorized activities, motorized activities, and camping. And then you have wilderness areas, and you have the fire suppression and or management, which you're trying to do more management than suppression nowadays. But they're losing that battle also because of um, climate change. Um, last year, over half of the budget of the National Forest Service went to fighting fires because they're getting so much severe because of the different droughts and things that are going on. And they're actually having to take money from other programs to fight fires. And so they've been asking for more money from Congress for a while now to um, fight the fires. But you just look at that list and you know you look at mineral extraction or logging, and then you look at camping and some of the other motorized, you know, non-motorized and motorized uses, you realize there's going to be conflicts. And so a big part of what the Forest Service does is try to figure out how to manage user conflict. What's going to be locked? And some of the more, um, you know, things we've, I'm sure how many of all you folks with gray hair like me probably remember the spotted owl controversies out on the west coast over, and, and that was all about are we restoring a species that's endangered the, the, the um, spotted owl or are we going to do logging? You know, we get this, the same thing here in Wisconsin. Um, now, the interesting thing in Wisconsin is that the um, paper industry isn't as big as it used to be in a lot of paper mills at full, so there's not as much logging going on in both the federal lands and the state forests. And so because of that, in the northern part of the state, as the forest ages, different types of animals take advantage of the habitat because it's changing. So one of the controversies in Wisconsin right now, I'm sure you've heard of the wolves, some people hate wolves, some people do, some don't, but they blame wolves because there's no deer in northern Wisconsin anymore. Well. A big part of the problem is that the habitat has aged and it doesn't support deer like it used to. You know, Wisconsin, when it got, northern Wisconsin, when it got a reputation for being a deer hunter's haven, was because it had been clear cut and you had a young forest and it was all regenerating and it provided lots of food for the deer. Now that's changed, it's an old forest again and there's less deer. But people don't want to look at that, they just want to blame the wolves. Bureau of Land Management, I think they own more, they, they, they um, how do I say this? They, yeah, supervisor. supervisor, yeah, so anyway, they manage more federal land than anybody else. And the agency was actually started under Ken Truman as president, and he took two other agencies that were responsible for federal land, one was for grazing and the other one I forget what it was for. But anyway, he, managed, he merged these two together into this agency. And so, once again, it's multiple use, um, because grazing was their original uh, program, but also energy extraction, um, especially um, oil and gas. Um, they're leasing, they're always putting out leases for oil and gas, and that can tend to be really controversial at times, depending on where the lease is and conditions. Um, wildlife habitat recreation. Now, when I was on their website, they're really promoting mountain biking right now for whatever reason on BLM lands. Um, and 
And the wildlife habitat leads to hunting and an awful lot of people, if you have friends that go out west to hunt antelope or elk or anything, there's probably a really good chance they're on BLM land. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, also has charge of a lot of land. Um, we have the Trumplow Wildlife Refuge not too far away. We also have the Upper Mississippi um, Wildlife Refuge, which stretches for hundreds of miles along the Mississippi River. And that's actually really cool how it got started. The guy who lived in Winona was a millionaire and he liked to duck hunt. He wanted to preserve habitat, so he started buying land along the Mississippi River and then he gave it to the um, federal government and became the wildlife refuge. So they also, um, we have some of these actually here in Dunn County, waterfall production areas. And these are usually just where they will go in and buy a wetland and they manage the habitat for waterfall. I'm out in western Minnesota when I lived out there, they're everywhere. And that was one of our main places to hunt was the waterfall. We just call them portal areas for, for production. And then they also operate fish hatcheries all over the United States. Some of the other things they're in charge of is the federal duck stamp program. So if you're a duck hunter, um, in order to, or actually any kind of waterfall, any kind of migratory bird, you're required to buy a duck stamp. And I think they're 15 bucks a year, I believe. Although I know they keep raising the price. But anyway, um, all of that money goes for habitat improvement for waterfowl. And then the other one is the Pittman Roberts Fund. And this fund was started in the 1930s. It was actually, it's a tax, an excise tax on guns, ammunition, and other sporting goods. And it was created in the 1930s at the request of hunters who knew you needed a regular source of funding for projects to both buy land to preserve the habitat and also to do the management on it. So you can imagine in today's world if people went to Congress and said, we want to tax ourselves, it probably wouldn't fly. But back in the 30s, hunters had a much different area. Um, so and, and, and the Pittman-Robertson Fund um, there's this huge pool of money, and the Fish and Wildlife Service uses some of it, but they also give a lot of it away in grants. And so a lot of it comes into the state of Wisconsin, it goes to the DNR, and then you can apply for it for different projects, for different things. And I know here in Dunn County, a lot of that money has gone into a lot of different habitat programs. Um, some, some things they do that lamprey control up in the Great Lakes, um, law enforcement activities and then also affects Wisconsin is the migratory birds. And it's not just waterfowl, in other words, it's not ducks, geese, and other things you can, you know, eat, but also all of the other different birds that will migrate from, you know, terns and whatever that go from the Arctic to the Antarctic and, and whatever. So they're also um, taking care of those and the, is it the whooping cranes that they're doing down at Mesita, trying to restore them? Um, that comes from that's actually a National Wildlife Refuge and, and that they're also working on projects like that. Okay, Wisconsin. We have a lot of public land. And obviously the Pestigo fire started here and that gave impetus to public lands in Wisconsin. Um, when Yellowstone came out, people said, you know, that's a good idea. Maybe we should do that on the state level too. And so that was how we got our, our state parks kind of got started. Um, I think the first one was Peninsula over in Door County, and it's still one of the busiest state parks in the world. Um, so the state bought, bought lands, um, some of them were donated. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, so one just south of Duluth with Big Manitou and Little Manitou Falls, or the big, tall, um, it starts with the key, okay. But anyway, that, that there was, um, once again, another wealthy person thought it was such a beautiful place and wanted it preserved. So when his developer friends were going to buy the land and turn it into a housing development, he bought it up from under them and then donated it to the state. Patterson, that's it. Patterson State Park. Yes. Yeah. That's just a beautiful place. So we have state parks. We have state trails, which right here in you know, we've got an extensive bike trail system that starts here in Dunn County and runs all the way up to um, Cornell. It's um, 
At one point in time, it was 70 miles, but I know they've added more, so we're probably up over 100 miles of bike trail right here. Um, and then we also have state forests. Like, you've got the Black River Forest, you've got the, um, all over the, uh, the American Legion, something or other up north. So there's, there's a lot of state forest land. And all of these, um, you get the recreation areas too, like Hopkins Hills, it's not a park, it's not a forest, it's the recreation area. So you have a lot of different types of public lands um, that the state manages in terms of like a park, for, for mostly for recreation. Um, although there was limited hunting at state parks that started probably in the mid 90s. And at first you could only hunt with a muzzleloader out of safety concerns. And they had to show that there was um, serious habitat degradation due to overpopulation of the whitetail deer. And they can do just amazing damage to, if they're not controlled. Um, but then in the last six years, all state parks have been open to hunting by anyone and also to traffic. And that was quite controversial with some people, as you can imagine. We have state natural areas, which they pick out certain terrains that are very unique or fragile, um, and then they take those lands over and usually manage it for whatever sort of endangered species or whatever type of habitat there is. Probably most of them around this area um, are along the Mississippi River, the St. Prairie River, and is anybody familiar with the term goat prairie? Oh, he is. Okay, we, got we have one. one. Here. Got <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, like I said, in, initially this area, the bluffs and stuff were actually prairie. And then with European settlement, trees grew up. But at the tops of the prairie, at the tops of the bluffs, there were still prairies. And they call them goat prairies because there's only a goat to climb up there. But they used to drive their cattle up there and stuff to um, graze them. And so they created a unique habitat, a prairie habitat, kind of on top of these bluffs. And there's a lot of species, including rattlesnakes and other critters that were really dependent on them. And because the land use changes in the last 30 years, they're kind of disappearing. They're starting to be overgrown with forests and whatnot. And so now there's an effort to try and preserve them. And um, they're you know, restoring and cutting down the trees, doing burns, planting prairie grasses and whatnot that belong up there. Um, Fish and wildlife hand, lands, um, these are areas that are primarily bought for fish and wildlife and set up for hunting. Um, in Dunn County, we've got some of the, got a huge amount of land down along the Chippewa River, Dunville Bottoms. Um, last, last year, <laughs> late last year, the, um, the Natural Resources Board agreed to buy 960 more acres from NSP to add it to the Dunville Bottoms. <laughs> And so that sale is dragging itself on as the state comes up with the money to buy it. We also have county forests. And um, we really don't have one in Dunn County, but counties can set up a county forest. There's a huge one in Eau Claire County. Um, you get up north, um, Washburn, and most of those counties have huge tracts of county forest land. Um, once again, that also came out of the fires and they needed a way to keep track of the land, and then they decided to turn the job over to the county rather than the state doing it in some instances. And so manage the forests, and they're primarily managed for timber harvest, but they're also useful for things like hunting and fishing and bird watching and whatnot, and camping. 